Okay, hi, we're gonna talk about diabetes. This is part five, and we're especially gonna talk about the plasma cell membrane of the skeletal muscle. This is actually the most important thing to know about diabetes. And there's a great paper here, it's listed right at the top of the slide, by Anthony Jay and James Hamilton from 2020, and it's inhibitors of fatty acid transport across membranes by CD36. <clears throat> Disrupt intracellular metabolism, but do not affect fatty acid translocation. And the reason this is such a big deal is because the essential question is, what causes diabetes? And it's already been shown, um, going back to the 1920s, you know, the famous Sweeney paper from 1927, the Hemsworth papers from England coming out in the 1930s, 1940s, the Rabinowitz papers from Canada, and a whole bunch of other papers, the work of Nathan Pritikin, Dr. McDougall has a good lecture on So that's an important point. It's well known that excessive dietary fat increases insulin resistance, which causes diabetes. In addition, that's been proven um, even more definitively by the work of Gerald Sheldman, uh, MD, PhD from Yale and his group, where they've used nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy to show that intramyocellular lipid, that means fat inside a skeletal muscle cell, is the first detectable sign uh, that's an indicator of diabetes. He's got a good lecture. You can watch it for free online on YouTube, uh, Gerald Sheldman's lecture. He won the Banting Award as the best diabetes researcher in the world for 2018. <clears throat> Okay, so the point of this paper here is that the, it appears that the mechanism, the fatty acids, are getting into the skeletal muscle cell after eating a meal is by what is called the flip-flop maneuver, whereby they are initially deprotonated, allowing them to interact with the charged phospholipid head, which is also polar, and then they become protonated. They intercalate themselves into the outer layer of the outer leaflet of the bilayer, which is the plasma membrane having an outer and an inner layer, and then they're able to flip-flop to the inner layer and then enter the cell cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle. And this is a huge, big deal. Because what he's saying is people primarily thought that they were getting into the skeletal muscle cell, the fatty acids, by coming through to CD36 as the name of a fatty acid transporter. But in his research experiment, even when they block the fatty acid transporter, those fatty acids just keep getting into the skeletal muscle cell uh, quite rapidly, and there the CD36 transporter inhibition can't stop it, can't control it. So what is what am I saying here? This is a big deal. This is like the most important thing you can know about diabetes. It, it appears that the skeletal muscle cannot control the amount of fat that comes into it, that it simply takes it up in a concentration gradient dependent fashion, meaning the more fat there is in the blood, the more fat gets into the skeletal muscle. So that enables excessive amounts of fat to get into the skeletal muscle. And when excessive amounts of fat get into the skeletal muscle, they go into the mitochondrial matrix, the center of the mitochondria, where they undergo uh, beta oxidation and they produce electron carriers, NADH, FADH2, but they produce them so rapidly and excessively that they overwhelm the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. And we'll, we'll go into that slide in just a moment, but trust me, this is a big, big, big deal in terms of understanding diabetes physiology. Um, so what's the lesson to be learned from this? Like, what do you do? Well, if you want to avoid diabetes, minimize your dietary fat intake. The paper's pretty easy to read if you want. You can look up the paper yourself, and uh, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Oh, by the way, I'm reminded of Dr. Uh, Nathan Pritikin, not Dr. Nathan Pritikin wrote about um, what time you test a person's oral glucose tolerance test to see if they have diabetes. And what they found was if you test them in the morning, a lot of persons after having fasted overnight, um, they might test negative for diabetes. But you test them in the evening after they've had high fat lunch, a high fat dinner, and most of them will test positive for diabetes. In one group, it was all of them tested negative in the morning, all of them tested positive. So the joke of that is many persons in this audience right now, many people you know that don't realize they've got prediabetes or diabetes, they actually have it if they're consistently eating high fat meals. Um, another way too, you can ask yourself too, it's good to not just hear something, learn something, read something, but to think about it and just Look around the world, the populations that eat a high percent of plant-based diet, like look at uh, the Asian countries before 1970, uh, like uh, Okinawa, Southern Japan, 
Um, other parts of Japan and China, for example, when they ate large amounts of rice, 80 to 90 percent of their calories, there's almost zero diabetes in those communities. Uh, Papua New Guinea, where they're eating, you know, more than 90 percent of the calories from sweet potatoes. Any population eating a predominantly plant-based, starch-based diet, they almost never get diabetes. So that's how you know, because you're going to see some people on the internet saying, "Oh, the best." way to prevent diabetes is a low carb diet. That's not correct. You can decrease some of your uh, blood tests for diabetes by eating a very strict low carb diet, minimizing the amount of glucose that comes into your body, but you pay a high price for that. That type of diet is inherently difficult to sustain in the long term. And in addition, those same patients will fail the oral glucose tolerance test typically. So um, that's not a healthy way to go, just so you know. You get in, like I said, think it through for yourself. Start looking at the epidemiology of all these plant-based populations. Look at the Tarahumata in northern Mexico, et cetera. It goes on and on. You'll see that that's the case. Okay, just real quick. This is a, a conceptual staging system for diabetes. I just created this myself from reading. You won't find this specifically in a book, but it's pretty clear from reading about it. This is what's happening, that the fat is first accumulating in the skeletal muscle. Well, actually, first accumulating in their body fat. And so their adipose tissue will accumulate more fat, and that's not good. There's almost like it appears to be a limited size those fat cells can get before they start to having more spillover of fat into the blood. Um, but then, most importantly, accumulation of fat in the skeletal muscle. And we'll show a picture of this in a second. We're going to get on to something really interesting. Where this talk is going is we're going to talk about cardiolipin, which is a unique fatty acid, uh, phospholipid, within the mitochondri mitochondrial membrane. That's really interesting. So those are really the two big things in this talk, getting the cardiolipin and what we just covered about the skeletal muscle being unable to control fat entry, which is a big, big, big deal. Okay, so fatty accumulation of skeletal muscle that causes overnutrition, induces insulin resistance in the skeletal muscle. Normally postprandial, that means after eating, about 80% of your glucose should be taken up by the skeletal muscle. And it's a great reservoir to just store that glucose as glycogen for the next time the muscle needs to exercise. Um, and that makes everything run fine. And the glucose that you eat, some of it will also go to the liver to replenish the glycogen stores, which the liver uses to maintain blood glucose level you know, in between meals, while you're fasting, while you're asleep. But when you get accumulation of fat in the skeletal muscle and it causes insulin resistance, then the glucose uh, type 4 transporters can't get up to the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. So glucose will accumulate in the blood. You're going to get hyperglycemia, high blood glucose. And some of that extra glucose will go to the liver, and the liver doesn't have a use for it. It can only store a limited amount of glycogen, so it'll convert it into fat. And that, along with the dietary fat you eat, with the other things that can get converted to fat, like alcohol and high fructose corn syrup when it's uh, present in excessive amounts, those lead to a fatty liver. Once the liver becomes fatty, it becomes insulin resistant, and you start then accumulating fat in the pancreas. And that's really bad, because the pancreas beta cells the fat is toxic to them, and that will lead them to uh, lose their ability to produce insulin. And once a person has fully lost their beta cells, then they become insulin dependent. So they become an insulin dependent type 2 diabetic. Um, so you, you want to reverse diabetes as fast as you can. During the first four years, according to the work, for example, of Roy Taylor, the physician out of England, he also won the Banting Prize. I forget the exact year. I'm going to guess 2012, something like that. Anyway, he, he wrote that book, Life Without Diabetes, which is quite good as well. But the point is, after the first four years, it starts becoming less guaranteed that you can reverse diabetes with diet. The more time goes by, the more difficult it'll be to do so because there's going to be fewer beta cells with intact uh, function producing insulin. Okay, then you start getting uh, problems with the arteries, the microvasculopathy, the eyes, and we'll look at the next slide that kind of shows all that. So I know you've probably seen this before. We'll go through it fast, but basically skeletal muscle accumulates the fat. Once that's sort of overwhelmed and you get hyperglycemia, um, then the liver starts accumulating the fat. So insulin resistance in the skeletal muscle will lead to postprandial hyperglycemia after eating. Insulin resistance and fatty liver will lead to uh, fasting hyperglycemia. The blood glucose stays high around the clock. Okay, And then you start accumulating fat in the pancreas. Pancreas beta cells can't make insulin and the pancreas fails. We see this on CAT scans all the time, fatty atrophy of the pancreas. And then the cells in the body which are not able to regulate the rate at which glucose comes in, they simply take it up in concentration-dependent fashion, they will become overwhelmed with glucose in the same way that the skeletal muscle was initially overwhelmed with excessive amounts of fatty acids um, in the mitochondria. And so that's where you get the diabetic retinopathy, diabetic nephropathy, kidney failure, and the diabetic microvasculopathy, which leads to frequent amputations.
every day. Every hospital in this whole country amputates a bunch of diabetic feet and legs. Okay, here's a slide just showing what's happening with the fat. With insulin resistance, normally insulin tells the fat after a meal to shut down lipolysis, li lipolysis. Lipo is fat, lysis is to break something down. So lipolysis is shut down under normal conditions. But I'm sorry, when you, when you have insulin resistance, what happens is the fat cell just keeps on releasing fatty acids into the blood. And so you get this vicious cycle going and the, the patient's not going to uh, reverse the process until they stop eating so much dietary fat. And then we talked about the fatty acid goes into the beta oxidation uh, process in the mitochondrial matrix, et cetera. And those are all the complications. Okay. So the, the big reason for this talk was I've added a few new things since the last talk on diabetes. So this is part five of the five lectures that have been uh, provided on diabetes. All right, so what you probably haven't seen before, it's new on this slide, is the cardiolipin. It's a unique phospholipid in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So IMM is a typical abbreviation for inner mitochondrial membrane. It has four fatty acid tails. It's really like a double phospholipid. Um, also unique about cardiolipin, it's pretty much unique to the inner mitochondrial membrane. There's a little bit of it sometimes in other locations, but the real money location for cardiolipin is right in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And it also um, is attached to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is a very important uh, protein in the inner mitochondrial membrane. We're going to come back to the significance of it in just a moment, and that's going to be a highlight of this talk, what we talk about with regard to cardiolipin. What happens though with st standard garden variety um, insulin resistance is that you get overwhelmed with beta oxidation of fatty acids and then what they do is they then start sending these electron carriers FADH2, NADH to the inner mitochondrial membrane. The electrons are passed down like they're rolling downhill from complex 1 to complex 2 through coenzyme Q, complex 3, cytochrome C, complex 4 and they're pumping protons in an intramembranous space to build up a proton grating. It's a very high grating. It gets up to like about 160 negative uh, millivolts, and that's about the highest gradient in the human body. And then the gradient is harvest to take a proton and bring it back down through ATP synthase and to make ATP. That's what normally should happen. But when this gradient gets too high, um, complex number three is overwhelmed and it no longer has the ability to pump a proton into the intermember space. So the electrons start to reverse their direction. They go to coenzyme Q, bounce off of coenzyme Q, and a single electron is given to oxygen, which is not supposed to happen. And the oxygen is converted into a reactive oxygen species, a free radical called superoxide. If it only happens in small amounts, which does occasionally happen under normal conditions, the mitochondria has enzymes like uh, superoxide dismutase to neutralize it, make it into water. But when this is happening in large amounts, the superoxide dismutase is overwhelmed. And then this can lead to other the formation of other types of reactive oxygen species that can travel to the nucleus, damage DNA. They also can travel up to the inner mitochondrial membrane and damage this cardiolipin. That's a big deal. We'll talk about that in just a sec. So the key enzyme that gets inhibited, first of all, there's just a, a net backup of traffic. When electron transport stops, then there's a, a backup of traffic in Krebs cycle within the mitochondrial matrix, and then that carries on to glycolysis, which occurs in the cytoplasm. Um, so the key enzyme, though, that ends up being inhibited is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. So GA3PDH, same thing as glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. So that's, this ends up being a very big deal for the complications of diabetes. So the substrate located immediately before that enzyme is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And that then is diverted into several different side pathways. Of course, you know, it gets diverted into production of diacylglycerols, which then activate protein kinase C. That causes insulin resistance specifically, as well as other major problems. But one of the things we're going to talk about here that's a major issue with diabetes is the formation of advanced glycation end products. So those are called AGEs. You've probably heard a lot about these. There's different categories of AGEs, advanced glycation end products. The most famous one is hemoglobin A1C, which is an indicator of overall glucose control over the last three months or so. And that specifically is primarily what one thinks of in that context is like glucose itself from hyperglycemia binding to uh, the hemoglobin protein. But there's a different category of AGEs in um, I think it's probably the most important category here. This is advanced glycation end products formed due to uh, 
accumulation of methyl glyoxal, typically called MGO. And MGO is made from this accumulation abnormally of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and it's a side pathway. Okay. Um, All right, we talked about some of this stuff. Uh, one reason I'm showing you this slide is here's the references if you want to read about these on your own. We talked about the plasma membrane of the uh, skeletal muscle cells. Here's another paper by this guy's group, James Hamilton. Here's a great paper by uh, Michael Brownlee on pathobiology of diabetes complications unifying mechanism. This is a genius level paper. It's one of the best papers I've ever read. Um, Shulman is the guy out of Yale with his group, and they are the ones that showed that IMCL is intramyocellular lipid concentrations correlate with insulin sensitivity in humans. Basically, they showed uh, with magnetic resonance spectroscopy, accumulation of fat in skeletal muscle cells is the first detectable finding in insulin resistance, which means causing diabetes. Okay, here's another side pathway. It's kind of a minor side pathway, but it's worth knowing about. Glucose, the first molecule at the beginning of glycolysis, and one thing I like to note about it is it's an aldehyde in the sense that you've got a carbonyl group, double bond from carbon to oxygen on the carbon number one, and then just a hydrogen over here. So uh, carboxylic acid would have a hydroxy group here. You just have an H, so that's an aldehyde. So I call it glucohyde. And that sort of reminds me later on, I'm going to be talking about glyceraldehyde as the next key thing to think about. And if you, if you become interested in glycolysis, that's going to end up being useful to know. And also this polyol pathway, typically its job is to detoxify toxic aldehydes. Well, glucose is an aldehyde, and so when it's present in excessive amounts, which normally is not going to happen, but under these circumstances it does, it can then be shunted into being converted into sorbitol. But the, the reason I'm showing you this polyol side pathway as a complication of um, insulin resistance is that it depletes glutathione. When the NADPH um, is oxidized, um, the glutathione, the reaction of it, it's going to take away your antioxidant capacity, and that's going to make the diabetic more vulnerable to a lot of other problems, infections, um, cancer, and other things. Okay, so here's a big fancy slide. And what just, you know, biology is basically just following a story. So, we're going to go through this step by step. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, that's the enzyme that was inhibited. There's a, a specific mechanism. You don't have to know it, but it's through PARP. It's a DNA repair enzyme. It's a long story, but that enzyme shuttles into the, uh, the nucleus. That's how PARP can get to it. And anyways, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase is inhibited. The Brownlee paper does a fantastic summary of all this stuff. All right, and then what happens is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate accumulates it gets shunted into becoming MGO, methyl glyoxal, and then that is super hyperreactive. It's a double carbonyl. You can see the two carbon double bonds to oxygen here, and that will do a lot of things. It'll exit the cell, and it'll start to glycate the extracellular matrix proteins. That'll trash the basement membrane regions, for example, around the kidney, causing diabetic nephropathy, glomerulosclerosis. Um, and also, this is an endothelial cell, the cells that line the arteries. So those are very, very important cells to keep a person healthy, and they get quite severely damaged in diabetes. In addition, the MGO passes out of the endothelial cell, goes into the blood, and it'll glycate proteins in the blood, like albumin, very important protein. Um, and um, it'll damage the proteins when it glycates. So that means it binds to it and distorts the shape of the protein so it's no longer as functional as it was before. We talked briefly earlier, we mentioned that glucose will glycate the hemoglobin called hemoglobin A1C. 1C sort of just refers to the purification method for it. Um, but that's an indicator of glucose control over the last three months. These then are now called AGEs for advanced glycation end products. And they do cause accelerated aging, just like their name would suggest. The most common type of these AGEs, like we said, is methyl glyoxal related AGEs, advanced glycation end products, then the glucose related advanced glycation end products, and then fructose less commonly, because fructose mostly gets metabolized in the liver. It's just not that common to have that much fructose in the blood. Okay, so the AGE then can be taken up by macrophages and uh, immune system cells like mesangial cells, kind of like the residential macrophages of the kidney. And this receptor is called a RAGE receptor. That's for receptor of advanced glycation end products. It will take up the AGE, and that will activate something called nuclear factor kappa B, uh, like a transcription factor effect on the nucleus. 
and you start to make inflammatory cytokines, which have the effect of being uh, prothrombotic as well as causing inflammation. So in diabetes, you get all these positive feedback loops of vicious cycles causing all kinds of metabolic damage. In addition, um, there'll be increased activation of nitric oxide, NADPH oxidase, often called NOx. So all these bad things are happening, increased oxidative stress, increased inflammation, uh, prothrombotic blood. But the key point of this slide was just to realize the insulin resistance causing a backup of glycolysis, you know, subsequent, initially started by the backup of electron transport, then the backup of Krebs cycle, now the backup of glycolysis, leads to uh, this side uh, pathways of MGO from glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, and then just extensive advanced glycation. And basically, that's partly why diabetics are so in such poor health, because their bodily tissues are being destroyed all over the place, destroying the endothelial cells, destroying the extracellular matrix, destroying the blood proteins, destroying the immune system. And that's why they have a poor immune system. They're very vulnerable to infections. That's also why they're less able to sequester cancer within their bodies. So smart move, reduce dietary fat, soon as possible. That's the first thing that they should do. Okay, um, this was just a quick reminder that they've depleted their glutathione uh, from running the polyol pathway for the same reasons. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit more about um, cardiolipin. So cardiolipin, again, is this unique uh, phospholipid with four fatty acid tails attached to cytochrome C in the inner mitochondrial membrane as part of the electron transport chain. So cardiolipin is a very important phospholipid. Okay, so here's how it's spelled, cardiolipin. And again, it's relatively unique to the mitochondrial membrane. It has three glycerols in it. So glycerol is like propane triol. Okay, three carbon molecule, and a typical phospholipid would be like what we see here on one side. The three carbons of glycerol attached to a phosphate, and then two fatty acid tails. That's your typical phospholipid. What's unique about cardiolipin is there's another glycerol stuck right here in the middle, and it attaches it to another phospholipid. So it's really like two phospholipids stuck together by a glycerol in the middle. And the reason it's a big deal is that it will have these fatty acid tails that are typically a PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acid, meaning more than one double bond. Um, I was in a hurry and I drew three double bonds in there. There really should only be two because typically it's going to be linoleic acid. As a matter of fact, when there's four of them, they'll call it tetralinoleal, all right? And so linoleic acid is the essential omega-6 fatty acid. You know, C18 means 18 carbons, two means two double bonds, standard nomenclature there for uh, fatty acids. If you put an omega in there, it would have a 6 after it for omega-6 being the first double bond at carbon number 6 from the methyl end. But the point of all this is that the hydrogen in between the two double bonds is what's called the methylene bridge hydrogen. And because of the electron pull by the double bonds, there's only a weak grip on that hydrogen, and it can be plucked off very easily. And that can initiate a cascade of lipid peroxidation, a damaging set of free radical oxidative stress reactions. When that happens, it'll distort the, ch the shape of the fatty acid tails, and they'll lose their, their, um, their bond with the cytochrome C. And the cytochrome C will come off free from the cardiolipin, and it'll then be dislodged away from the inner mitochondrial membrane. And that's a disaster because that tells the cell that the mitochondria is no longer functional. Therefore, the cell cannot survive without functional mitochondria. So it activates a pathway for apoptosis, meaning programmed cell death, to recycle those chemicals. It's better for a cell to the body if a, if a cell that's dying has enough time to recycle itself because then the chemical contents of that cell can be reused somewhere else. But if the cell just rapidly dies, then its inner contents uh, are spilled out through a gap in the plasma membrane and it just causes a lot of inflammation. It's a big mess that has unusable chemicals. So that's why apoptosis is so common in the human body. But the point I'm making is Lipid peroxidation of PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids in particular, um, leads to this cascade chain reaction of destroying mitochondrial membranes. And it is thought that mitochondrial destruction and deterioration is the main thing that causes people to age. So having this insulin resistant causes accelerated aging. And the big thing that does it, you know, dietary fat puts the red blood cells into a stack of coins configuration called Rouleau formation. 
that causes tissue hypoxia, which is damaging to mitochondria. The excessive dietary fat also overwhelms the skeletal muscle cell, as we spoke about, because it takes them up in concentration-dependent fashion. And if a person is eating high-fat meals around the clock, they're taking up way too much uh, fat into cells like the skeletal muscle that cannot uh, control the rate at which they're taken up. They simply go by the concentration gradient in the blood. Um, so then when you've got insulin resistance and you can't make enough insulin to overcome it, you'll start getting hyperglycemia, and that'll have similar effect in other cells. But the bottom line is excessive blood lipids, hyperlipidemia, causing insulin resistance and tissue hypoxia is a mechanism for causing diabetes. It's also a mechanism for inducing cancer, as we spoke about previously, with the Warburg effect um, due to hypoxia causing mitochondrial damage as well. Um, and, yeah, that's enough of a point. There's a little more information on the slide if somebody's interested, but that's the gist of it. Okay, now here we're just going to, we're almost done here, just finishing up. We'll just talk a little bit about lipid peroxidation. What's that all about? So here's a double bond. So again, this is, this is the carboxylic acid. So this is the carboxyl end of a fatty acid, okay? And, you know, carboxylic acid has a carbonyl group, double bond from carbon to oxygen, and then a hydroxyl group right here as well. Um, this is the methyl end of the fatty acid. So we'll count from the methyl end. This is carbon number one, two, three, four, five, six. Double bond at that location. So this is an omega-6 uh, fat. And then there's typically going to be a carbon in between with no double bond on it, and this is called the methylene bridge. A CH2 is a methylene group, so this is a methylene group. And then there'll be another double bond typically spaced just like this, three carbons away. So this is C6, this will be C9 with the next double bond. But the point is these two double bonds are pulling on those electrons so that this carbon has only a weak grip on the hydrogen. This hydrogen pretty easily is plucked off and then you end up with a free radical at this location, an uh, unpaired electron. And that electron then can react with oxygen and form a peroxide. A peroxide is two oxygens uh, adjacent to each other bound to the carbon. And then this will also be a free radical, and it can react with other adjacent fatty acid tails and damage them and distort their shape. And this can be an entire chain reaction damaging multiple uh, fatty acids within the phospholipid bilayer of a mitochondria, for example. And that chain reaction, it'll destroy plasma membranes. So again, this is lipid peroxidation. And this is also one of the reasons with ingesting excessive dietary amounts of PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, meaning having double bonds in them. The more double bonds you have, the more vulnerable the fatty acid is to lipid peroxidation. So if you look at you know, a saturated fat, it's relatively unreactive because it doesn't have any double bonds. If you look at a MUFA, monounsaturated fat, like oleic acid for a C16, like typically in olive oil, it's the main thing in olive oil. Olive oil also contains some saturated fat and a little bit of PUFA as well. But that's more reactive than a saturated fat, but not as re reactive. Saturated fat, I'm sorry, a polyunsaturated fat, a PUFA, is much more reactive. Um, meaning, by, and by that I mean more prone to this lipid peroxidation which really can cause a lot of problems. And so even though polyunsaturated fats don't have as much of an effect to raise blood cholesterol as does saturated fat, they still did not provide a protective um, advantage. And this is a big introduction of PUFAs into the diet in the 1960s to replace sat fat, but it didn't work for prevention of coronary artery disease. Um, and one of the things I worry about and why I don't supplement with uh, PUFAs is you got a real high risk of this lipid peroxidation, especially the more double bonds they have. You know, if you think about it, EPA has got five double bonds, DHA has got six double bonds, so they're quite vulnerable to lipid peroxidation. Okay, so yeah, again, this is just a reminder again of our cardiolipin. It's in the membrane. When lipid peroxidation destroys its fatty acid tails, it distorts its shape, it loses its bond to the cytochrome C. Cytochrome C then gets freed up and diffuses out of the mitochondria, and that's a signal to activate the apoptosis program cell death pathway, and um, the cell dies. So that's a bad thing. So lipid peroxidation is a big deal. And so you got all these PUFA tails sitting on this cardiolipin, 
And then if you're overgenerating these superoxides, overwhelming superoxide dismutase, it, tra it transforms into a hydroxyperoxyl uh, radical that gets into the membrane, damages cardiolipin, cytochrome C is freed up, exits apoptosis, cell dies. So um, that's what you don't want to have happen. Okay, that's it. So I hope that's helpful.